Well, I'm sure it's a surprise to some of us here as much as it was to the Andersons, but we are very thankful. It's when uh, music is from the heart and it's for the Lord, there's no mistaking it. And we're blessed. And if any people in here have praises, if you have a song in your heart, you need to come give it for the rest of us. Um, and, you know, if you don't know their, their whole story, if you're curious how things are going, come talk to them. And uh, Gideon's here, and he's an adult, so talk to him. <laughs> and he's brought his friend Dante. If you haven't met him last week, he's here today. So make sure you take the time um, that we get to be a church, which means we get to be together. So thank you for that. I enjoy that a lot. In fact, I'm not even sure how to jump from that into the sermon. So God is going to be working today. <clears throat> I mentioned last Sunday that you would need to return today for the rest of the story, right? And you're here, so you've kept your side of the bargain. I will try to keep mine. Last week, we saw that King Nebuchadnezzar had a challenge for his advisors, the magicians, the astrologers, that he, they needed to tell him both the dream he had and then, of course, the interpretation. But even with their own lives in the balance, none of them could grant his request. It was an impossible task, and they made an absolute statement in verse 10 of Daniel chapter 2 that I wanted to just quote once more for us, there is not one person on earth who could declare the matter to the king except the gods, but they do not dwell among mere mortals. Let me open our message this morning in prayer. Father, I thank you for being here with us this morning. I thank you that you don't live on some fantastic island or hill or in clouds and universes that don't exist, places that we imagine, but that you have your own abode and that you do communicate with us your creation. And I'm thankful that you're here this morning, that you speak to our hearts like nobody else can. And I ask that you would do that for each one of us individually now as we come to your word and seek to gain an understanding of it. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to read our passage, which will be in Daniel chapter 2. Um, we got all the way to uh, verse 24 last week. Uh, and I want to try to get all the way to chapter 3, although we may actually end a little bit before that. Um, but not to worry, I'm not cutting out anything. So let me start reading. If you're in Daniel chapter 2, I will start um, in 25. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were in bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me... This mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. 
That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, its breast and his arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and caused you to rule over them. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So, like iron, that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In those days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to you, king, what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. I'm going to stop right here. In fact, later on, I would encourage you to read 46 until chapter 3. You will see what happens for Daniel. It is a long section, and it goes with the first part. So read both together if you don't remember. But this is not, you know, just an interesting Sunday school story for kids. It's not. God has used his very humble and young servant, Daniel, to expose some key truths. True for them, true for us. God alone is God. That's a key truth. You can't miss it here. God is not the same as created humans. That's also what we see. God is not the same as the imagined creation of the false gods that we have. He is distinct. And I'm going to add another one here for us. Humans come and go. God remains eternally. This is the word of God for us. In verse 25... We begin, and I think if you look there, you will see that time was of the essence. People were about to die. So Arioch quickly, quickly, quickly brings Daniel into the king's chambers. And I think you might have also noticed that Arioch seems to try to take credit for finding Daniel. And such is often a challenge for us. I thought of this this morning. I thought of it part of the week. And... As Christians, a mark of being spiritually mature is not seeking your own glory, 
the accolades that go with being in service or in ministry. That would be a mark of being spiritually mature. If God gives you a task, a skill, a ministry, be content to serve in that capacity. Don't make yourself sound better. Don't go boasting. Don't feed any feelings of power that might come with that. It's, it's a danger, and it doesn't serve God to do that. And we see Daniel here. We see him not doing that. He could have, but he doesn't. In fact, don't worry about somebody else getting the spotlight. And you may think, well, I don't have a position. I'm not up on stage. I don't have that danger. But we do. And I'm going to give you just an idea of how this works. Because sometimes, even in church, whether in Bible study, whether we're talking with people, we get a little concerned that we might not get the spotlight. Or that the spotlight that should be on us might go to somebody else. It happens. And that isn't spiritual maturity. I know, you're surprised. How did I get there from Daniel? But I think it's there, and I think you will see it with me. For those of us that have been parents, and most of us in here have been a parent, or if you're a child and you have a smaller sibling, you will know that many times if you're playing a board game with the younger person, you let them win. Have you done this? If you haven't, you're not a nice person. No. <laughs> But you've done this. We've all done it. There's a small child. You know you can win. It's easy for you, especially with a small child. So you let them win. What have you lost? You've lost nothing. What have you gained? A lot. And in the child's eyes and in their life, they get more. So it is with us together when we gather. The same thing applies. And, you know, sometimes we get worried. Well, you know, I have the answer. We're in a group, and, and I've got the answer, and I'm going to be, you know, I, I want to put it out there. You might have the answer, and that is good. But what about that other person that is young in the faith? Would it be helpful if we let them find the answer? I think so, like the child. So... Keep that in your own mind today. Are there ways in which we can demonstrate a spiritual growth and maturity that it lets others grow a little bit? That's my deviation. But I think you'll see that Daniel does this. And to go with this, I have asked, I've given out a few post-its. You will have to read your little verse loudly so that the people in the back can hear you. We don't have microphones. So when you get, uh, when it's your turn, and right now we're going to have Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And do listen up here to see how this fits. Take heed that you do not your alms long before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have not no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when, do, when you do your alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand does, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward you openly. Yes, thank you for the microphone. Um, if you were following along, if you weren't, do you see the point here? Again, drawn out by how Daniel is doing things. This is for us. We do serve in many ways, from, from our homes to, to Bible studies to helping missionaries. There are many, many things we do, but we need to be careful how we do them because God is clear here, don't. Don't go parading it around and lose your spiritual reward. Just do it. God knows. God knows your heart. We don't need to be impressing other people. So this is Daniel, to me, gives us this example this morning. 
And if you look now to verses 26 and 27 in our text back in Daniel, notice how Daniel speaks. He doesn't, I think, overstep his bounds. He doesn't seek his own benefit. He has been given the answer, but he doesn't say, hey, look at me. I got it. It's me. No, he's very careful. He keeps the focus on God who gave the answer. If we go to verse 28, he says there's a God in heaven who reveals. Daniel, standing in front of the king, I would think might have been a little bit fearful. You're in the king's court. We know he's angry. He's put a death sentence on people just like Daniel. But there are also probably some of them there. And Daniel is about to reveal what they couldn't do. Oh, yes. And if you come next week, you will see the problems that this is going to create. Yeah, jealousy in the court. Oh, yes. Power grabs and struggles. Here's Daniel in front of these men. They have spent a lifetime charming the kings deceiving people for their own benefits, for gaining power, prestige, authority. But Daniel will now affirm in public, none of them could give the answer. Oh, it's a scary place if you think about it. None of you. <laughs> I would probably, you know, find the corner and the exit before I made my statement. No, that Daniel knows. God told him, none of you can do this. And Daniel says, and neither can I. Important point. Very important point. We don't need to forget where we get our spiritual power and gifting. It's not from us. It never is. Thank God when you get it and you persevere. But remember, it's not from you. Verses 28 and 30, um, it appears that if we read the text here, the king was resting uh, and began to ponder the future. Apparently, he had some leisure time. And he would be pondering the future of his empire. empire. And to his great surprise, I think, God, who created the universe, invades his thoughts right there in his mind. Dream, vision, somewhat interchangeable. And gives him a small snapshot of the future. Probably not what he was expecting. But this vision of the future is world history going far beyond Babylon. Oh, that would have been something to behold. And I thought of this again. Do not each of us human, and that's all of us here, don't we think about the world from our own perspective, our own personal perspective right now? That's how we see the world, isn't it? I don't see the world as though I'm an aborigine. I don't. I don't see the world as though I live, um, you know, in, in Trump Tower down in, in New York. I don't. I think of it basically right here, just like you do. And do we ever encounter the world in a different way than our own point of view? our own place in time and history. This is how we encounter the world. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was no different. He was looking then. So this means to be human, we only have our very short life with which to measure, with which to ponder life, humanity and all of its questions. We only have ours. That's it. I think, like Nebuchadnezzar, our personal perspective is a little bit short-sighted. We can look back at history, but even then we do it from our personal present. So let's not be too hard on him. As we read this story of the statue, I'm going to tell you, I am not, um, to my wife's great chagrin, big into poetry. I studied it in school, like many of you. I never really liked it because it was so fraught with interpretation. 
I tend to be kind of a literal person. But as I am studying this the last week, a piece of poetry came to me, yes, from many, many decades ago. And I thought I would read it to you. I, I don't hear it as poetry. I see the image. And I'll see, I know you guys will recognize this right away, maybe. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias. King of kings, Lord of lords, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Okay, you may not be into poetry either. But as we contemplate the statue, all that's left is a vast expanse of sand and these two feet on a pedestal. The joke, of course, the irony is on the person who that represented. There's nothing left. Nothing. Ozymandias, you can read it later. I think then how absurd are the statements that people make believing we're so great that we will endure, that our works will endure, um, that history might remember us. I will give you a few examples in a second, but verses 31 to 35, this is the dream, right? We've all been waiting for the dream, so here's the dream. And there's a statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Statues would have been very common at that time, very common. But making a statue out of distinct, different metals would not have been common. The top part of it would have been bright and shiny in the, as the sun hit it, just fabulous. And the feet of mixed with clay, iron, would have puzzled them just like it puzzles us. It doesn't make any sense the two don't mix. And then, of course, there's the rock. What is this rock that crushes it all? You see why I was reminded of the poem, Nothing Left? Well, so far, so good. The king must have been amazed. The impossible had happened in his very sight. Daniel had actually recorded his inner thoughts. He had done the impossible. This is why Daniel repeated several times that the revelation came from God. Oh, yes, important point. For all of us, again, Christians who follow Christ, where does our power come from? Yeah, let's not be fooled. Let's not lay on our own wreaths, rest on them, and think that we're special. That's called pride, and many fall with that. And it doesn't take being at the top of a huge conference in front of thousands. It just takes one or two people that you talk to. When you get to verse 30, and I apologize, we're going to back up just a second to verse 30. Daniel says, but as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me any, than, any more than any other living, but for the purpose of the interpretation. He's making a statement. It's not because I'm wise. It's not because I'm very learned that God gave me the interpretation. Does that remind you of anybody else in biblical history? Joseph it is. Joseph in the Old Testament. Not Joseph and Mary. Back in Genesis, if you'd like to turn there, I will read just two verses. Genesis chapter 41. I'll give you 
just a second if you'd like to turn there. Genesis chapter 41. It'll be verses 7 and 8. I'm going to start at the second half of 7. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now in the morning his spirit was troubled, so he sent messengers and called for all the soothsayer priests of Egypt and all of its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Well, that sounds familiar. In 14 and 16, we continue, Then Pharaoh sent word and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Look at the next verse. Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it has nothing to do with me. God will give Pharaoh an answer for his own good. The parallel is striking, isn't it? Two, two young people in a foreign land, in a foreign court, who don't have a position of status, who aren't part of the culture, per se, both in front of an impossible task for the ruler, top person. And both of them mature enough to say, it's not me, it's God. That's why I mentioned that earlier. I wonder if we have this spiritual maturity in us or if we might begin cultivating it. And I want to reiterate from last week that I think you are wasting your time and money if you ask a secular psychologist or a dream specialist to explain your dreams to you. I was going to say something like, you could give me the money and I could tell you things, but, <laughs> but then I would be just like them. So no, let's not do that. Um, but I'm reminded when, when people do this of how some people look forward to crunching down on those really hard styrofoam fortune cookies after you eat at an Asian restaurant. Um, in fact, I've begun to notice that many people actually discard the styrofoam cookie and just go for the paper fortune. Have you noticed that? I have. Do you place any truth value in those pieces of paper? Sometimes, see? See? Do you know that these are neither of Chinese origin, nor are they made in China? Oh, no. I'm sorry to tell you that uh, these things that people rely upon for the rest of the day, at least, uh, they're made in America to the tune of five million each day. So if you thought there was a wise man with a long beard, Sitting on a mountain, no, these are machines, they spit them out for you. Um, it's interesting that they're almost exclusively made in America. I thought that was interesting. Okay, moving on, verse 36. This was the dream now, we will tell its interpretation before the king. I'm thinking to myself right now, well, that's lucky for you because God's going to interpret this dream for you this morning, not me. Same thing. I don't want to be in that position of doing God's work because I might be in error and I don't want to be. It's always best to let God take care of the eternal and the spiritual world. Don't try to do that for him. So in 37 and 38, we keep moving here because he's going to describe the dream. And it begins well enough, I think, Nebuchadnezzar may be relieved that he was indeed, as stated, the king of kings. That's what Daniel says. Yes. <laughs> and the imagery speaks of a vast empire. It would encompass all the humans living there, the birds, the animals within there. It's, it's his entire empire. But I wonder if in, in 37 to 38, if Nebuchadnezzar caught the fact that all this power and empire was given by God. I wonder if that caught his ear at all. Wait a minute, what? 
Because I'm, I don't think a megalomaniac wants to hear about how his accomplishments are going to be replaced or how they came from somewhere else. We don't like to hear that. And in verse 39, that's what is going to take place. He says, after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. And then another which will be great and endure. So we're going to move quickly from the head that depicts Nebuchadnezzar himself. And now the rest of the statue depicts different empires following. Being the king of the greatest empire at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, I don't think hearing his amazing society would be replaced by another would have brightened his mood. I'm just thinking. And I don't think hearing that it would be lesser than his society would have made it any better. You're going to be replaced. Oh, and they're not going to be quite as amazing as you. What a strange thing to hear for Nebuchadnezzar. But he learns, number one, his mighty empire will not last. It's not going to last. Well, that's not what he envisioned hoping to see in the night. That's it. Your empire is not eternal. And in be replaced, some weaker king, some lesser soldiers are going to show up and take over. How is that even possible? Everything you've built, your society, gone. Remember when we started, we talked about how big Babylon was? Massive. Gone. Dangerous king for a volatile, a dangerous news for a volatile king, I would say. But I want you to see, is there a truth now here common to all people? Does your mind wander through the pages of your history and come to the same place this morning? Do you have this finite human perspective in mind? Most of us don't. We like to think of the future, long and vast, and that somehow we are in it, don't we? We forget that we're finite. Do you really think this morning you're going to live forever right here in this body? Do you think that? Nebuchadnezzar might have kind of thought that for a second. <laughs> no. Do you think you're going to live with the house you're in? How often do we have to watch our grandparents or our parents go into nursing homes? Yeah, the house is gone that you thought you'd be in. What about your expensive toys? What about impressing people with your possessions? Or, you know, maybe you have a PhD. Where's it going to go? Maybe you think you still have a long life to live with many exotic adventures very normal that you're going to leave your mark behind. Remember the poem that I read earlier? All that was left. Well, as we look briefly at these four kingdoms that are coming, I want you to think back in your mind, or if you studied history, about the great empires of human history. Now, some of you like archaeology. Some of you like history. Think back. The British Empire... Oh, it was big worldwide. It had its height in maybe the 1920s, much later than people think. All over the world. Where is it? <laughs> Back in Great Britain, a small little island. Uh, the Spanish Empire flourished before it. By 1800, it was all over. You couldn't travel the seas or they would take over. Where is it? Just Spain. That's all that's left. The mighty Mongols, huge empire. They took whatever they wanted. The Golden Horde, they just came through on horses. It was over. Mighty, mighty, mighty. I think of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. Took everything. What is left of those world powers today, of that civilization? What's left? The tiny little countries, splintered countries. But the actual group, they're gone. They're no longer there. 
you know, if you like exploring, you might think, wow, the, the ruins of the Aztecs and, and the, the Incas, they're fascinating. These, these structures, these huge cities, well-designed, well-laid out. Do you know that those civilizations only shined or lived for 200 years? That's it. All of that. 200 years and nothing. Babylon, 68 years and nothing. Isn't that amazing? You see how we need to reformat our brain a little bit here. Look at human history just a little bit different. The Great Wall of China is all that remains of that particular dynasty, as vast as it was. The, the pyramids in Egypt is... is the Egyptian empire like it used to be? Not even close. Not even remotely close. All that's left are some pyramids, some, some hieroglyphs, you know, some things we like to look at. It does not exist. So they're all gone. For all the power, for all the accomplishments, forever but a footnote now in our pages of history. That's it. Because humans do not live in the past, we live in the present. Humanity now revolves around the now, wherever we happen to be. Don't fool yourselves, people won't unfortunately remember you. But that won't matter to us, will it? Where will we be? If we're with the Lord, that doesn't matter to me a bit. It shouldn't matter to you. All right, it's a little bit depressing, I know that. It's a little bit sobering this morning to look back at our human history and to see how short our life is. And it is short. But I, I wanted you to see kind of <laughs> what was happening to Nebuchadnezzar at this point. That's what he suddenly came to realize. And now I want to um, get a few verses because it's always best to let God talk. So somebody has Psalm 139. Uh, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to be. One more time. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's right. All the days numbered by God. Okay, how about one more? Uh, let's see, we've got Job, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 5. Since the days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. Excellent, thank you. Yes, that's Job 14, 5. A, a pers NIV will tell you a person's days are determined. You're not going to get less than what God wanted, and you are not going to get more. That's in the Bible. That's, what, that's us. Psalm 90, verse 10. I'll read that for you. You can turn to Psalm 90. There are two different verses there in Psalm 90. Because, again, this is God laying this out for each of us. Verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is only trouble and tragedy, for it quickly passes and we disappear. And in verse 12, so teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Ah, there it is. Our days are short, so we should probably use them wisely. And as Christians, that means the way God would like Back in our text here, we get to verse 40 in Daniel chapter 2, and we learn that there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. So what are these kingdoms? Some of you have studied this before. It's not a big surprise to you. Um, there isn't a whole lot of debate uh, with scholars over what these kingdoms were because they're not anymore. We have, of course, the next kingdom that follows are the Medo-Persians. Not, not just Persia, Medo-Persia. It is a two-part kingdom. 
and, and the distinction is crucial later on. Um, and they are, that is Cyrus the Great. And they will be followed by? Greeks. We have the Greeks that show up. That's right. And next? Rome. The iron. Rome. Rome. Very important. These are the kingdoms. Um, Rome, of course, lasted a very long time. Babylon, I think I'm, if I said 68, it's actually 66 years. Babylon existed before Nebuchadnezzar, but the glory and the power all came for 66 years. The Medo-Persians, their empire would last for 208 years. Not that long. Um, and then we've got the fast-spreading Greek empire of Alexander the Great. Very fast, just impossibly fast conquest. And it lasted 185 years. See, all these things that we imagine we know of history and how short they really are. Very, very short. The Roman Empire did last around 1,000 years, depending if you take you know, the Roman or the uh, Eastern Byzantine version. That's a long time, 1,000 years. And so, yes, highly influential to us today. We have vestiges of the Roman law, the principles that they used in society. Architectural design is with us from the Romans still. But the Roman Empire is gone. It doesn't exist. As big as it was, it's gone. So the focus of the dream is not the human empires that are going to follow, is it? No, they're gone. How could that be the focus? No. Rome came and went. Thus the iron in the statue came and went. In verse 44, we find... In the days of those kings, the God of heavens will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all the others. In the future days of this iron and clay mixture, I think is where we need to set this. And in 45, you notice we're back to the, the stone, <laughs> this big stone that crushes all things. God is making a clear distinction between the mortal, the impermanent human world of empires and the stone which is outside of the mortal world. It's very distinct. The stone is not made by hands. It's not made of any human government. It's not shaped by human minds. The stone is outside and it is the imagery for God, for his eternal and uncreated character. God stands outside of time, outside of space, outside of human history. This is where God is. This is the stone. And I think the imagery or the allusion to God's kingdom is clear enough from Scripture. We have other places that describe this. But I think we're too quick to look for the earthly explanation. In fact, we want that. What does it mean? What, what does it mean for me on earth? Forgetting the distinction. And so let's get the distinction. Somebody here will have John, the Gospel of John, chapter 18, and we will read 36 through 37. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Is that all there was? Oh, there's, okay. I may have one extra verse I put down. <laughs> and Jesus says, You say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born and have come into the world. Okay, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Don't be looking for another empire. No. He's, Jesus is speaking of a spiritual kingdom. But there is something else for us to look for and expect, right? 
something we can still look for. Can we not interpret the signs? Can't we be ready? Can't we focus all our energy on that? Well, one more verse. We're almost to the end this morning. One more verse that I am not going to read. Uh, Luke chapter 17. Uh, let's get verses 20 through 24. You, oh, up here, okay, in the front. So that's Luke chapter 17, 20 through 24. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, not will they say, Lo, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire no one no, when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Lo, there, or lo, here, do not go, do not follow them. For as the lightning flashes and the lights of the sky, up in the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Yes, exactly. Do you see why I put those verses in there for us this morning? When we look at our text, we, we can get very excited about figuring out the end. We can have great discussions, and I encourage those, by the way. I like discussions. We can get excited. We can get books. We can watch YouTube videos. But we're not told every detail. We simply are not told every detail. And even the details we're told are a little bit hard to understand. If it wasn't so, we wouldn't have so many different interpretations. We don't know, for instance, if Europe is the iron and the clay remnant of Rome, from which maybe later on will come the superpower, the federation of ten. We don't know for sure. It's a, it's a possibility. And I will leave that as a possibility because it doesn't tell me clearly in the text. So I will let you figure this out. We do get very curious. We have uh, ima imaginations, some more or less active, but some things have been hidden and kept by God. And I want to ask you, though, does studying the end times change how you live today? That would be a very important question for me if I decided to really start studying it. How will this change how I live today? Does learning about God's end plans cause me to grow spiritually? Okay. And then do you and I count our days and seek the lost? Is that something that we focus on? Because the end is near, nearer every day. And our job is to follow Christ and share the good news while we still have breath. I'm going to close this section for today. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are gracious enough to give us glimpses of who you are and what you have planned. And I thank you because in your wisdom you have determined what we would know and what we wouldn't know so that you would remain God and we would remain humans. I thank you for your spirit that enlightens each one of us and I ask that you would work mightily in us, that you would teach us, that you would grow us to be in the image of your Son, that we'll be lacking nothing spiritually and able to save others who need to know you. Send us our way this morning with your peace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.